Hello, guys. We'll be starting in a couple of minutes. All right, all right, here we go. This is the RPG Pundit, the final boss in Internet Shitlords, and I'm coming to you live for the first time, apart from my little announcement video yesterday. Can everybody hear me okay? Let me know. So it's, uh, it's 10 p.m. here in, in, in South America, uh, 9 p.m. Eastern, and uh, today is already the... Uh, the warm, the, the, the spring has already sprung here. You know that in the Southern Hemisphere, we have the, the opposite uh, seasons from those of you in the Northern Hemisphere. And just to tell you a little bit about uh, Montevideo's climate, uh, because apparently now that's what we do when we're talking about RPGs. We talk about the seasons. Have you heard of this? In the new Waterdeep book, they spend quite some time describing the seasons and seasonal activities that happen in the city of Waterdeep. So here in the city of Montevideo, in, uh, in the winter, there's maybe four weeks where it gets really cold. And that really cold is like five degrees, right? And sometimes it even dips maybe a little lower, like maybe three degrees. And then just people just go nuts. Right? <laughs> so uh, that's coming from Canada. You don't really think of that as really cold, but it, it can get a little chilly, right? And then sometime around now, around mid to late September, sometimes there's a little last last gasp of winter but sometime around mid to late september it shoots up to about 20 degrees which is about what it is right now and then it stays that way for eight months with well it gets hotter actually but by by late october it's 30 degrees and there's a period of time in january and february where it never gets below 30 right where it's like 35 heading towards 40 so crazy hot weather but uh it's one of the benefits of living down here that uh there's very short winters and uh, long, long summers. So I wanted to start by talking about, uh, I don't know if, if you've seen the uh, new Titans photo, the official photo, the exclusive that was sent out to, I think it was called Entertainment. Uh, I don't know if that's Entertainment Weekly, but uh, if you look at it, it's a picture of the, the four Teen Titans of the new Teen Titans show, and yet another example of how modern modern leftist SJWs just destroy everything. I don't know what the hell they're even thinking. I don't even know. I don't even know if this is if the SJWs are to blame. Right? This looks like something that was created by a 68 year old executive who was going like, "Oh yeah, we don't know what the kids want today. The, the kids want a douchebag with green hair or something like that." And uh, yeah, that, so you've got Changeling in the picture. If you look at this photo, Changeling looks like this total fuckface who'd probably have a really annoying laugh. Uh, and then Raven looks like a, a goth chick from the middle of the 1990s. Because if there's one thing that's going to appeal to the kids, to Gen Z in 2018, is a character that looks like she stepped out of my so-called life. And then Robin looks exactly to me. I don't know. You look, judge for yourselves. Tell me if I'm crazy here. But he looks to me just like the villain in Kick-Ass. You remember Kick-Ass, right? The movie, Hit Girl and all that, right? Uh, in Kick-Ass, I think it was called The Red Mist, who was like a, a complete asshole, right? This, this privileged little shit that gets owned by everyone and that you're, it's de he's designed for you to hate him. And even his face, you know, his look... Everything about him makes you think, you know, wow, this guy's just a dick, right? And that's what they've done to Robin. And then, of course, as we well know, Starfire is a literal street hooker, right? Uh, she's, 
She's looking pretty much like the the original uh, leaked videos from the from the filming made her look. And they had promised, oh no, that's not going to be her final look. And lo and behold, there it is. It is her final look. Socratic Method Man. This is a live stream about a guy ranting and swearing and answering your questions relating to RPG uh, stuff and popular culture, nerd culture in general, right? <laughs> so, so yeah, yeah, Starfire, they told us. No, 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 that was just, there's going to be special effects. Of, nope, she looks literally like a, a crack whore from the, from the inner city, like, like not even a real one, like a bad... You know, like a movie of the week crack horror from the 80s? She looks like that. So what are these people thinking? And, you know, this goes along with the reinvention and ongoing destruction of pretty much everything in nerd culture. We've been seeing it in Waterdeep. I did a video about, uh, about Waterdeep, and uh, some people asked, is it... Were you really quoting when you talked about when you described the you know Seattle and then it it turns out to be the description in the Waterdeep? Yes, I was quoting verbatim on that video. I was absolutely quoting all of it just as it is. And they go to this great extent of describing um, Waterdeep as basically a fantasy version of Seattle, right? It's a city. This great multicultural city with the food and with the all the uh, the cross dressing dance halls and uh, the the festival of people expressing their sexuality and and you're like you know this is not the water deep I'm familiar with I mean uh, yes some people have pointed out right that Ed Greenwood is a huge sexual libertine and it is hardwired into the setting of the Forgotten Realms that you know people are polyamorous that people are bisexual that there's a whole bunch of um you know free love going around right but that's very obviously not what this is right we know what this is we know what the agenda is here this is the social justice agenda and it's not ed greenwood's kind of rumpy bumpy hour right <laughs> where he's you know going around having sexy parties this is all about imposing this ideology on all of gaming um, and, and it's not really a sex positive ideology. It's an ideology where you're supposed to applaud the sexual expression of certain people, but not other people, right? Heterosexuality is never the answer. But, but you know, Ed Greenwood to these people would be, you know, <laughs> a, a, a case to be seriously investigated for the Me Too movement or something like that. You know, he'd, be, he'd certainly be condemned as a sexist, misogynist, old white male. So don't tell me that this is something that they're doing because it's in the tradition of Ed Greenwood. That's just bullshit, right? So, trying to get my pipe lit here. Waterdeep uh, is a world that in the original, that is a setting, that in the original world was a place where you had people that went around heavily masked, right? Uh, like the, the, the street guards were, had to go around hooded because if not, they would be hunted down by the by the criminals, right? It was meant to be a sprawling mega criminal city in the style of Lankmar, right? Or Port Black Sand or places like that. And now they've turned it into, you know, diversity central fantasy Seattle. Now, I've already ranted about this before. I wanted to point out just a couple of more things. Um, and meanwhile, you guys, if you do end up wanting to have general questions to ask me rpg pundit related questions you can start putting them up on the on the chat or you can just keep commenting on what i'm talking about here or asking questions about what i'm talking about here right now the um the first thing i wanted to point out is that in this in this quote that was you know jeremy crawford has taken credit for it uh, it talks about how how wonderful these people are who express their sexuality all purely and they do this as if as if they were the gods themselves right how lovely that is right well you know that is in itself an absolute expression of 2018 values right maybe not just seattle values it's representative of the general mess that uh, that western society is in 
right? But it's certainly not a characteristic of fantasy, right? Fantasy, if fantasy is derived from archetype, from myth, and from legend, what's the one thing that you see in all classical fantasy, right? The great error, the great error of, of the hero in the hero's journey, right? The undoing of the hero is hubris. It's when he tries, when he comes to think that he is like a god, right? That is the central um, fall of all heroes in the Greek sagas, right? That that when you start to say, oh, that they're like, nobody in, cla in the classical world would have said, wow, isn't it great that these people think that they're just like the gods, right? That they can do whatever the crap they want, right? That they would be saying, I'm going to stay away from these people because Zeus is going to strike them down, right? <laughs> and if not Zeus, then Jehovah or whoever, right? It was always a feature of the classical world. And, excuse me a second here. I have a cat in my way. Ah, there we go. I think that's where she wanted to go. So, this is like quite endemic to me. Like it's, it, it, I think it's, it's, it's a symbol of everything that is messed up with this, um, with this agenda that they have and with Western culture in general, you know, and with the specific way that they fail to get the point of fantasy or archetype. Um, before I, I continue explaining why, let me answer a couple of these questions. Um, I, I like pretty much any old single malt scotch. I'm not very picky about that. Um, I like really high-end vodka. My, my preference is stuff like Sobieski. Um, <laughs> I don't know how relevant those questions are, but fine. And, uh, the um the question about the city guard i believe that that was in the the original um water deep in the north or water deep in the city of slenders i'm not sure which um it might i mean I, i'm like you like the person who asked the question i've had a whole mess of of reading of forgotten realms and most of it was like 20 years ago so it's hard for me to to say which one it was. It might even be because I even looked at Ed Greenwood's original notes and stuff like that. So, so it could be hard for me to say uh, exactly where it was if it's not something that was all that common. Um, Dave, I'm going to talk about The Witcher in a moment. I think it's a very particular case that needs something needs to be brought up. Um, and my preferred edition of D&D, &D, I guess the one that is closest to my heart is the BECMI, that is to say the, the rule cyclopedia version of D&D. &D. Um, it's the one I played the most in, in its different versions throughout my, my youth in gaming. Uh, I'm also a big fan. I mean, I like most editions. I mean, uh, I'm a big fan of AD&D first edition. Um, I got into gaming a little too late to have played the original D&D &D edition. So I really started with the basic expert and AD&D first edition. Of the two, I tended to like, for most of the time, I, I tended to like the basic expert sort of, you know, BCMI version more. And uh, second edition obviously was not as good, but it's still D and D, right? Um, I liked third edition when it came out. It ended up being way, way overburdened with with junk. And uh, by the time that it was finally taken out, it was probably far too late, and it was all just you know bad bad management. And then I like fifth edition. So like I said, every real edition of D and D I've I've enjoyed. Mm -hmm. To varying degrees and to say nothing of all the excellent versions of uh, osr games that are there osr takes on on the game like lion and dragon medieval authentic role playing by the rpg pundit you haven't played medieval fantasy until you've played lion and dragon and so uh getting back to what i was saying about this uh this this thing about hubris and the gods right 
in in medieval fantasy and in all all fantasy up to you know quite recently in relative terms i remember when i say quite recently i'm a guy who thinks that you know i when people ask me oh what type of novels do you like right there's um, i'm not a big novel reader because to me they're they're not as interesting as uh, classical myth and classical, you know, legend and classical religious stories. Um, there's a reason it's called novel. It's because it's only about 200 years old. It's a novel genre, right? So a little more than 200 years now. So for me, like the, the up until very recently, it was very obvious that, that mythology was meant to show ideas of everything that humans are capable of and also to show um, what their limits are, right? It was designed to mark those kind of landmarks. And uh, the, one of the problems with the SJW movement is that they don't believe that anything is true, right? That's a fundamental aspect of postmodernism. So of course they think we can be just like the gods. And the problem is mythology is full of cases of people who said we can be just like the gods and ended up you know, being completely smoted, <laughs> smitten, smited, smited, destroyed um, by the gods. And by the gods, I mean by the natural consequences of this. I don't know how many of you are, are big readers of um, this sort of stuff, but there was a, an article recently written by Rabbi Sachs, the former um, chief rabbi of the United Kingdom, I believe. And he was, he made an excellent point about um, the, this question of you know the, the liberation of our modern society and how excellent this this liberation felt when we you know broke free of this idea of duty as being an important aspect of our lives of our duties of of following um, of having some responsibility beyond our own immediate self satisfactions. Uh, and that, and that that liberation seemed really wonderful. But now you see, after the course of decades, the consequences of that. Uh, that if you don't have anything that you actually believe in outside of the self, you end up with shattered societies, right? With these societies where everything is falling apart, where there's no coherent, so, no coherent culture. We don't have a coherent culture anymore. We've got a bunch of little subcultures, half of which are at war with the other half. And uh, you, you don't have any kind of coherent sense of bond with things, even like family, right? We've seen the disintegration of families because of this stuff. This is what happens when people say, well, you know, we don't need this idea of um, a respect for something greater than ourselves. We don't need to have this as this concept of truth. So, yeah, that's that's. That's what this is about, and that's what is being promoted here. And, you know, it just gets me to thinking, right? If, this, if Waterdeep is 2018, you know, fantasy big city <laughs> with, with Seattle-type values, like, what are those masked guards of Waterdeep doing now, right? Like, I, I'm guessing that 4,000 of them have been put on the job of stopping hate speech, of hunting down and arresting... Um, hate speech people <laughs> and uh, then that's that's why they don't have enough time to stop orcs from driving carriages down busy streets and mowing people down in the streets right this is this is the paradise that they have created somebody asked me tell me about uh the vrv why, why does he play the cat boy well he plays the cat boy because he's really weird right <laughs> he's a weird guy before that he played moo and uh before that, he played Chu, and uh, he, uh, he, he likes to play these kind of uh, weird characters. In my Wild West campaign, he plays Kid Taylor, who is also weird. So that's, that's pretty much the reason. And I could tell you things. We've seen things, but uh, the, I, I probably shouldn't share them. There are things that cannot be unseen about uh, the guy who plays Catboy. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, Broodmother Sky Fortress destroying Waterdeep. That's a that's a really uh, 
a, a very good idea. Maybe somebody should suggest that to Jim Raggy. <laughs> so I was going to put it later, but I'm going to I'm going to bring this up um, at this point regarding uh, The Witcher because somebody mentioned it. I don't I haven't seen The Witcher RPG. I'm, I'm not familiar with how it's handling uh, the the style of The Witcher. I'm kind of curious how they would be handling it. Uh, it's not OSR. If you want an OSR version of The Witcher, you can just do like a modified version of Lion and Dragon. Lion and Dragon, medieval authentic OSR role playing by the RPG Pundit. <laughs> this is the RPG Pundit here and we are live answering questions and making comments about uh, the collapse of civilization. So with The Witcher series though, we've already been told that apparently they are casting for um, Ciri, a character, uh, one of the central characters of the novels, which were then later turned into the, the video game, because they were novels first. These novels were published, by the way, and this is very important to understand. The, the, the original short story of The Witcher was published, I think, in 1986. So this was when Poland was still crushed under the boot of the Soviet Union and the Soviet communist system, okay? And Poland had always resisted this, right? It was the one country that most resisted the, the Soviet rule. Uh, Czechoslovakia and Hungary also did a lot of that, but, but Poland was just absolutely defiant, culturally defiant, because they, they didn't have the ability to fight the Soviets. They, they weren't going to get rescued in this by the, you know, fight them with guns, I mean, uh, or to be rescued by the Americans or the British who had sold them to Stalin. Um, but Poland had cultural resistance. This was what they did. They tried to find ways with very subtle stories and subtle messages that reinforced fundamental Polishness against the Soviet attempt to erase Polish culture. And you see this in a lot of things, in some Polish films, in some Polish novels, um, and then, of, of course, in Polish Catholicism, which led to, you know, John Paul II and all that and the eventual role that 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 played in the fall of, of the Eastern Bloc. So The Witcher isn't just some dumb fantasy story. I mean, it is in one sense, but it isn't in the larger context of what it represents. It is a fundamentally Polish story. It represents it's presenting a world that is basically a world steeped in Slavic legend and mythology. It has criticisms of culture that are fundamentally Polish criticisms of culture. It's a fundamentally Polish world that The Witcher presents. And beyond that, it's, it's really the first, you know, since John Paul II, anyways, if you can call him a cultural export, it's the first significant cultural export from Poland that has permeated the West in a way that nothing else has in decades, I think. Maybe maybe ever, I don't know, maybe, uh, certainly, certainly decades, certainly since John Paul II, if you want to call him a cultural export, Polish Catholicism, uh, or maybe Polish plumbers in the, in the UK, they're a, they're a good cultural export. Uh, but this is something that is fundamentally Polish. Now imagine, if it was the same thing and it was an African story, right? And it was an African story that was an African anti-colonialist story. And it had, you know, characters that were clearly meant to be part of one of these areas. I don't know, South Africa, let's say. It's a South African anti-colonialist story. And, uh, or, you know, you can name any African country. Could you imagine what would happen if they were going to do a TV series of the South African Witcher and they were going to cast Siri as a white girl, right? Instead of a black girl, right? Do you imagine the outrage that would happen? Do you imagine that how quickly those people would be put out of that project? For that matter, you don't have to go quite to the extreme of suddenly invoking Africa, right? Imagine if it was an Indian, if it was a Bollywood story, right? It was an Indian story about Indian culture with Indian people. And you end up casting a blonde valley girl as Indian Siri. Right. What would what would that mean? What would how would people react to that? You know, that would be directly accused of cultural appropriation. But because it's Poland and Polish people 
that that's fine. It doesn't matter if we shit all over Polish culture and we shit all over the Polish context, the fundamental Polishness of The Witcher and turn it into, again, Seattle 2018, or I guess in this case, San Francisco 2018 or whatever, right? The Seattle, Portland, San Francisco triangle and their little colony in Hollywood. This is what they're doing. It's the erasure of culture. They've done it to Waterdeep. They're doing it to The Witcher. They're, they're, the point of it all is to wipe out anything that is divergent culture because only when everything looks exactly like, you know, SJW headquarters, Seattle 2018, will diversity have succeeded in their mind, right? When nobody does anything different, everything has to be the same. Every cast has to be multicultural. You have to have a strong female black lead. You have to have whatever... <clears throat> one of the characters has to be LGBT, at least one in four of the characters, right? Because that's, that's an absolute minimum, right? Heterosexual relationships are never the answer. Um, all of this, which is, is being invoked not by people who actually, these people are actually claiming to represent. This is nothing to do about making it good for black people. This has everything to do about making it good for a bunch of social communists who, who are been guided by postmodern philosophy to destroy all the fundamentals of Western culture. That's who they're doing this for. They're pretending they're doing it for black people or that they're doing it for gay people. But what they're actually doing is fulfilling the programming that they received in college about how they have to annihilate the West, right? That's, that's their fundamental goal. Everything else is just invocation. So it's got, this has got nothing to do... The problem with Siri being cast as a black girl uh, would have nothing to do, or an Asian girl or whatever, as a non-Polish girl, uh, has nothing to do with anything that is wrong about Asianness or, or blackness or anything else. It has to do with what is wrong about the regressive left. That's what we're opposed to here. All right, I've probably missed some questions here. If I haven't answered your question and you really care about me answering it, please repeat it before I move on to the next topic. Um, I don't know how long I'm going to be on here in case anyone has just joined. This is the RPG Pundit, and I am here talking about all kinds of uh, subjects in the RPG world, controversy in the nerd culture, and uh, you know stuff along those lines. Thank you, Peace Already, for talking about... Lion and Dragon and Dark Albion. I'm very happy that you liked it. Um, I see we have someone who's either a communist or not sure if Sirius might just be trying to troll us here. Okay, that is interesting. <laughs> Real communism has never been tried. Okay, yeah, that's right. Real communism has never been tried. Uh, Any real communist would be absolutely appalled by, by what SJWs are doing, by the way. A real communist in the sense of someone who is a genuine Marxist, a genuine believer in the class struggle of the proletariat against the bourgeoisie. Um, and I know this because I know some real Marxists who are absolutely appalled by this disgusting um, pseudo-socialism that is postmodernism, which is really a tool of the bourgeoisie to take to destroy everything that the working class actually value, right? Lords of Olympus is a great game, super fantasy channel, and uh, uh, you do need to find people to play it with, but uh, you just got to get some gamers together and tell them, let's try this crazy game. My current Lords of Olympus campaign is uh, absolutely nuts and a lot of fun. No, that's right, Doc Sammy. I, I don't. It's rare for me to say that's right, Doc Sammy. But here we are. SJWs would be the first ones against the wall in an actual Marxist revolution. <clears throat> They'd be right there with all the other elites, with all the people that were on the on the million dollar yachts, uh, pissing all over the the fishermen during the Brexit vote. Right. The, those people on the million dollar yachts think they're the socialists. It's just ridiculous. Hussites in Lion and Dragon. Well, Hussites are a heresy in Lion and Dragon. If you check out um, Dark Albion, Cults of Chaos, uh, I, I think I mentioned the Hussites there. And uh, I mentioned them in the, dark, in the Dark Albion main book. 
uh, if you wanted to play the Hussites as not heretics, that that's an interesting possibility, but it's kind of complicated because the clerical order would not have, you know, they wouldn't have interfered to wipe them out if they if there wasn't some definitive evidence of them being heretics. You could have a game set right during the time of Jan Hus and basically decide that, you know, there's that actually the clerical order has been subverted by the church in the sense that the church has been putting them under control. And uh, then the Hussites are actually an attempt at reforming the church, which is what they were historically, right? Um, and, and maybe there, you know, if there, if there are enough clerics that switch sides, uh, maybe Jan Hus has a chance. Though I think it would be more interesting to do that with a little bit later in the, in the era with Martin Luther, you know, a bit after the, the standard campaign period of Lion and Dragon. But, uh, you know, you could do a hell of a game with, with the you know, Lutheran Reformation. Can you give me a shout out in a story you're writing? I would, I would have to understand what the shout out is like and uh, would, uh, would probably need to see it before I would approve of my name literally being used in a story. So, uh, yeah, because I, I don't know. I say yes to that and next thing you know, I'm showing up in like, you know, furry tiger porn or something like that. So no, the, let's let's not give a blanket permission to use my name in fiction. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, Muslim defense. Yeah, I think Rosen has has accidentally given himself away. I think he's a shit lord and not an actual communist because he would be. Uh, he would be he, he would not mispronounce misspell Muslim. Apparently when I'm live streaming my my alerts don't uh, my phone alerts don't turn off. Uh, well, whatever. All right, so to carry on, um, I'm gonna talk about uh, a little bit about the uh, about true Marxists, but um, Basically, before I finish, I, I go on to that, I'm going to say this is the part where uh, the section of our chat where the RPG pundit gets to have said, uh, I told you so about just about everything. Uh, what kind of music do I like? I like a lot of music. Uh, I'm a big fan of punk music, Doc Sammy. Um, but I also like some uh, quite a lot of folk music, so... Mm. A, a pretty eclectic variety of tastes, let's put it that way. Yeah, that's my cat's tail. <laughs> She's the, the only furry I can stand, uh, her and my other cat. So this section, as I was going to say, this is the section that we call The Pundit Was Right. And uh, the, uh, the first thing The Pundit Was Right about was Pathfinder. Um, well, not Pathfinder, really, but what's happening in Pathfinder proves me right about something I long ago predicted, right? People were saying, for a long time, people were saying, yeah, but Pundit, it doesn't matter what the SJWs want with gaming because, uh, you know, they're, they're, people are just going to play their own game and it, it's okay, it doesn't matter. Well, Pathfinder is proof of how that idea of, of let's not worry about it, let's not interfere, let's not try to stop these assholes because they're just going to do their thing and we're going to just do ours. It, it doesn't work because it creates, it gives, it hands over the culture to them. And then they take control. They change the games you like. And then you can still say, oh, well, you know, okay, so Pathfinder 2nd Edition is going to be full of SJW garbage. But I could still just keep playing Pathfinder. Sure, yeah, okay. But if that's the only thing that ends up being presented to people who are coming into gaming... The stuff that Wizards is doing now, the stuff that Paizo is doing now, and we don't mount some kind of an alternative that people can see, then that'll create two effects. First of all, the only people that will be attracted to gaming will be people who are part of that SJW culture. If they look at, you know, they look at the, they read that thing in chapter nine in Waterdeep, or they read the introduction, the social justice manifesto at the start of the Pathfinder playtest. Like, okay, yeah, this is this is a uh, some kind of freak game for social justice warriors. I don't want to have anything to do with it, right? Those, pe those people that would have become gamers will go look for something else to do if they assume that 
you know, because we've stayed silent, that all of the people that do gaming are people who have bought into the SJW agenda. And people were saying, yeah, but they can't interfere in your own game. Well, just you fucking wait, because they're going to find ways to do that. They're already doing that in live, in actual play, right? And in, in, um, in tournament play, they're, they're dedicating themselves to the beginning, the process of purging anyone who dares to not agree not just not even to disagree but if you refuse to agree then that is enough for them to expel you and if you look at pathfinder's introduction you know i said in my other video about pathfinder that it doesn't matter because paizo's going broke anyway and it is and that it's true nothing they do with at this point other than actually trimming down their company in a way they're not willing to do would avoid them getting broke but um what they've decided to do is go full woke. And in going full woke, they've decided to up the ante to something that I always predicted was going to happen, which is that in their, in their play test, um, social justice manifesto, Paizo has said at this point that you are not allowed to just game for yourself and the people at your table. You have to game. I think they put it almost, I'm almost quoting verbatim here. I don't have it in front of me, right? But almost verbatim, they had said, uh, you have to run the game, not just for gamers at your table, but for people not at your table. And what they meant by this is that it's, you, you have to follow the social justice rules of representation and diversity in in your table, whether you or any of your players want it or not, right? That you have to have um, black characters and gay characters and your setting has to have 2018 Seattle values. And that if you don't do this, then you are defying what they're doing. And you can say, oh, well, I'm just not gonna buy those books then. But it's only a matter of time until you're not gonna be able to buy any books that, that aren't um, following this track or to go to any events because they're going to take lists. They're going to demand loyalty tests. And if you don't believe me about that, well, you didn't believe me that they were going to say something this fucking stupid in the games themselves, did you? I said there's going to come a time where they're going to say, no, no, it doesn't matter. I predicted not four months ago that this was exactly what the SJWs are doing. They're talking about a community of role players, not uh, a hobby of role players, so that they can claim that people who have never played who have no interest in ever playing are still people who get to be in charge of what role playing games are allowed or not allowed to have and what how you are allowed or not allowed to play that that's that's what they were using all the critical role fans for that's why they're talking about you know um the the different identity politics groups they're claiming that those people even if they never lift an, a dnd book even if they never play pathfinder have a say they have a say on that they the sjw's themselves are doing it on their behalf of course they're the ones that that get to actively use that say to determine what you do and how you play and yes in the end if it's like you and your aging buddies that are slowly dying in in the basement when your wife allows you to play if that's all you care about yeah you can slink away and uh, you know fiddle while rome burns if that's how you want it, fine, right? But don't pretend that you can be an active part of this hobby, a vibrant part of this hobby, that you can be involved in the hobby and just let this happen and not in, and, and that they're going to just let you live, that it's just going to be bygones be bygones and no one's going to have a problem with you, right? These guys are determined to hunt you down and to demand that you agree. And if you don't agree, they're going to try to destroy you. And it might take a long time till they get to you if you're just a regular viewer, but it's going to happen, right? And, and they're going to go first after the the big names, right? The people that are that are the biggest opponents of them. But this is this is where it's going to happen, right? It's going to happen in the conventions. It's going to happen in the local gaming stores. We know people have been thrown out of gaming stores. We know people have been thrown out of conventions, not for any other reason than their basic politics, not because of anything they said or did. 
but because of stuff they've posted on Twitter, you know, not, be, not because they were offensive in the store. Um, this is what's happening, right? We are, we are customers, correct. And uh, the, the thing is, we have to be able to support people, like Solomon Cain said, we are customers. We have to stop supporting people who despise us. And we have to support people that do not despise us, right? We have to reward game designers who stand up for uh, freedom of speech, who stand up for actual diversity in games, right? Who, want ev who don't want every setting to be 2018 Seattle, right? Who want to give you a variety of ideas, right? And for me, that variety of ideas has included a really super medieval authentic game. It's included a game, you know, a medieval authentic game that might not have any non-white people in it other than maybe some Moors or some, some Turks, right? Um, but I also created Arrows of Indra, uh, which I use as my, my little avatar in this, uh, in my channel, right? And Arrows of Indra is a game that doesn't have a single white person in it. It's not about, you know, they're going to keep trying to portray this as being about hatred of minorities, right? Well, I, I did the best, most respectful, most researched, most detailed book on Indian mythology for any RPG ever, which is Arrows of Indra. And this is, this is the most reflective of what the actual, you know, stories of the Indian legends of the Mahabharata are like, right? The, 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 the great Indian epic and, and for playing in these epic Indian settings. And other OSR guys have done the same for Africa, for China, for different, for different parts of the world. Uh, I have to say, though, that the more that these people, uh, the SJWs, uh, attack at this level of trying to be directly confronting us on on uh, um, on tearing down everything that we hold of value, and that at the same time claiming that we're Nazis or something, the more tempted I am to do uh, a lion and dragon source book about the Crusades and uh, call call it Deus Volt, <laughs> and and hopefully have it be published by someone who's uh, you know got liberal credentials, right? Uh, I'm, I'm looking over at Venger because he uh, he votes for Hillary. So you know, if uh, if I do a uh, a crusade source book, um, but I mean I'd have to do it seriously. So don't don't expect it anytime soon because when I do a serious book, it takes me like a year to do it. I'm not going to um, I'm not going to do it's it's not going to be like GamerGate the RPG or some bullshit like that, right? If I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it in a way that's going to be really really good. And it's going to be reflective of um, the real truths of both the good and the bad of the Crusades, but making a point of presenting the Crusaders, for the most part, had very noble intentions. Um, of course, a lot of the, the uh, Muslims in that setting were trying to defend their home as they saw it, right? Um, the Crusaders were trying to save the Christendom Right, they were trying to to recover land that was taken by the Muslims, and all of that would have to be in there, right? Um, so there is a chance I'll do that. There's a chance I could try to do one about you know the Turkish invasions of Central Europe during the time of you know the Dark Albion setting. Maybe uh, I'll portray a, uh, I'll do a version of you know the the Curse of Dracul or something, like that, the the Curse of Tepes, uh, <laughs> where I uh, have the player characters involved in. Uh, the rise and fall of Vlad Tepes, um, who was, you know, when when Vlad Tepes murdered 20,000 Turks, uh, the Pope ordered bells to be rung throughout Christendom, right? So uh, this was, uh, and th it wasn't because he murdered them because he just wanted to. It's because they were invading the Christian world. And if you hadn't had people in Central Europe, in places like Wallachia and in places like Poland, putting a stop to that invasion, that would have been the end of the West, right? So this is uh, the vast majority of this history is not a history of evil white men oppressing brown-skinned Muslims. It's a history of Muslim invasions of Europe and Europe fighting back against that. Um, so anyways, yeah, I'll, I'll think about it. I'll think about whether I want to do that or what else I want to do. I've always wanted to do a Chinese game too, but... Uh, well, well, we'll give it some time. Right now, I'm busy with RPG Pundit Presents, which RPG Pundit Presents is, by the way, a uh, weekly uh, series of short PDF source books 
on a variety of topics, but under two general headings. One is Gonzo stuff, which is from my DCC campaign of the World of the Last Sun. And the other is Medieval Authentic, which is all kinds of source material for Lion and Dragon. If you have Lion and Dragon and you like it, check out RPG Pundit Presents on DTRPG or at the Pressis Intermedia web store because there's going to be a ton of source material. There are new methods of magic, new source books, stuff on, stuff on the realms of the elves, um, material on uh, medieval authentic caravans, adventure scenarios, quite a lot of them that are all medieval authentic and are all there for you. And they're not just for Lion and Dragon. You can use them in any OSR game. Notice how I have to dive into little advertising things here. Uh, this is not a monetized video. There isn't a, a, what's the, what do they call that? A super chat option. You can't send me a, you can't send me cash here. So the, at the very least, you're going to get some advertising from me. Uh, if you do want to send me cash, though, there's two ways you can do it. One is to support my, the Inappropriate Characters channel on, um, on YouTube. Uh, Inappropriate Characters is the, the web show that I do with Venture Satanis and Grim Jim DeBurro. The three together were the three most censored game designers in uh, in the RPG hobby, and uh, were quite controversial. And we talk about controversial stuff. It's sort of like this, except with two other assholes. <laughs> well, me and Venger are actually the two assholes. Grim is is the guy that likes to pretend that he's reasonable, but can't seem to understand that the European Union wants him put in a gulag. But uh, that's his that's his issue. Um, so you can support us there on Patreon, or if you only want to support me, go to my uh, my blog uh, on uh, the, it's uh, www. Or well, actually, I don't think you need the www. It's just the rpgpundit.blogspot.com, and uh, you'll see there off to the right. There's a pundit patronage site where you can um, you can choose to support me by sending me some money via PayPal. And you can send whatever you like. I will be very grateful to it. And uh, if I'm receiving donations of that sort, then I'll probably be doing more of this sort of stuff in the future. But uh, we were talking about Pathfinder. That's one way that I was proven right. I had said it. I had predicted it that it was only a matter of time until the actual uh, SAWs were demanding that the way we play have to reflect the interest of people who have no stake in the RPG hobby. Uh, I, I don't know if I'm more censored than Varg Vikerns will, but he's a piece of shit. So it, I don't think he really counts. I mean, he's a Nazi who literally killed people to try to uh, turn death metal in, in Scandinavia from being fundamentally Satanist to being fundamentally Nazi. So I really don't give a fuck about him. Association with him is, is stupid. And the, most of the people who try to bring that up are bringing him up the same reason that they bring up people like Richard Spencer, which is to try to uh, damn the entire free speech movement by suggesting that we actually like these guys. We do not. Uh, he's not a real game designer anyway. His game sucked. It was a stupid white power fantasy trip that... Uh, that is of no interest to almost anyone except people who are already inclined to his ideology. My games don't require, nor to my knowledge do Vengers or Grimm's require that you already be inclined to our ideology. You don't have to have voted Hillary to like Vengers games. You don't have to have voted Remain to like uh, Grimm's game. And you don't have to believe in Donald Trump to, uh, to like my games. You don't even, heck, you don't even have to be a libertarian, right? I've got people in my, who are playing my games with me at my table who are Marxist, right? Which will bring us to our, our last subject of the evening. But uh, if you guys have any, <laughs> I just saw that. My frog is like the Flintstones meets American History X. Yes, that's right. It's it's exactly like that, except that in America, it's, it would be a very version of American History X where the Nazi's the hero, right? <laughs> um, anyway, the um, the last subject of our evening for tonight, unless you have more questions for me about me or my games or anything else, conservative RPG creators out there. Well, I'm I'm a conservative in the sense of being a libertarian, uh, a right-leaning libertarian with... Um, classical liberal values. I guess it depends on what you call conservative. I'm not a religious conservative. Um, 
I'm I'm a believer in the free market, um, but uh, I'm not a neocon. So you know, there's a lot of that. There's a lot of variation there. But uh, there are conservative game designers. If 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 you're talking about my people at my kind of point of the spectrum, there's quite a lot of people in the OSR who fit that point of the spectrum. Um, the designer of Adventures Dark and Deep is basically conservative. Uh, Autark, of course, Alexander Macris is a um, is a conservative. He did uh, Axe, uh, Adventure Conqueror King system, and uh, some good source books for that. Um, I don't think you should really vote. Uh, you should really vote for. You should really buy products from people just because they're conservative. Now, I do strongly recommend check out Axe. Check out you know Adventure Conqueror King. Check out uh, Adventures Dark and Deep, um, and check out my games. But buy them because you think they're going to be good, and they are going to be good. My games are good. The Adventure Darks and Deep Game Master book I thought was really well written. Uh, Axe is a very popular game. I don't think I really need to be plugging uh, Autark's games because they're they're big and very successful. So most of you probably already know about them. But yeah, they're they're quite good. Um, Anti Vatican. <laughs> uh, look, I, I'm I'm not a, I'm not pro Vatican, um, but uh, you know that that is not the take that I get from the point of that game, and I'm not really interested at this point in in uh, continuing to. Yeah, I, I get the feeling that the person promoting it is doing this either because they're a true believer, in which case they're a piece of shit. Or because they're an SJW trying to associate uh, my games with that game, which is uh, also not good. So uh, thanks, but no thanks. Um, Kenser and Co. are, as far as I know, they are kind of cultural libertarian types. Um, I'm not totally sure. I've, I've, I've only really interacted with a couple of people there. Um, so I couldn't tell you. I mean, uh, GURP, Steve Jackson, he's a longtime libertarian, longtime libertarian, uh, a, a Texas libertarian, I guess you could say. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right, Vision Storm. In 2018, Grim Jim is a conservative left anarchist. Yeah. Well, he's, he's a left anarchist. And according to SJWs, he's an alt-right Nazi, right? <laughs> so, like, this is a guy who voted Remain. Who uh, he's an atheist. He's not a fundamentalist Christian or anything like that. He's quite well known as an atheist, actually. Uh, he's, you know, he's he's uh, a Euro socialist. He's a true believer in Europe. Article thirteen. I don't know how many of you guys are Americans. Probably most of you are because it's very late in Europe right now. But um, it, in the European Union, they have just passed a new law. Um, which is going to allow them to basically shut down any kind of meme, right? They, it's a copyright law, but the real purpose behind that of the copyright law is to uh, try to find a way to shut down the meme warriors of places like 4chan, because now any kind of image that comes out of anything that's copyrighted has to be paid for and and the websites that host those kind of images can be held responsible in Europe uh, for the posting of those images, financially responsible. And so this was a, a pact, a, a treaty that they made with an alliance between the big record and movie companies, who of course are always up after this, you know, and, and uh, the SJW crowd, because they know that the way that they're going to use this, because this law is just ridiculous, right? If you think about it, how the hell are they going to be able, there's no amount of manpower that even a, a bloated, disgusting totalitarian bureaucracy like the EU could put together to actually stop every single use of copyright on the internet. It just can't be done, right? So they're not going to go after all of them. They're going to say, well, we're going to make examples. And of course, the examples they're going to make are exactly people like Grim Jim DeBurro, right? They're people like him. Uh, they're people like... Count Dankula, people like Sargon of Akkad, right? They're going to go after these guys using that law to shut them down. That's the goal for it. So this is this is a, a really disgusting law. It's it's a law right out of you know 1984, 
And Grim Jim just did a whole video explaining why, even though he was against that law, he still thinks the European Union is better than, you know, just Brexit and, and that England is somehow worse and it's somehow less democratic, even though, you know, they actually have a democracy, whereas the EU system is about as democratic as the supposedly democratic system in Cuba, you know, where you can, yes, you have a, a part, you play a tiny part in electing sort of, a voting sort of for the MEP. You can't actually vote for the guy. You can put like the preliminary vote that will help determine whether or not any MEPs of the party you vote for are going to get to be sent to Brussels. That's it. But those guys have no real power. They can't propose legislation, right? So all real power is in the hands of completely unelected, completely unaccountable bureaucrats. And this is what Grimm is defending while the SJWs call him a Nazi. <laughs> That's the world we live in, in 2018, right? Uh, it's, it's just craziness. Uh, give me one second while I get my pipe here, my next pipe, because I, I finished this one. That was uh, a near-up poker with Country Doctor. And uh, the last thing I'm going to talk about is related to this and related to the growth of... Um, uh, the, the divergence between Marxism and SJW uh, postmodern identity politics, pseudo-Marxism. Um, for the record, I am not a Marxist and I don't like either. But you have to say that at, at least actual real traditional Marxists were a product of modernism. So they actually believed something. Everything they believed was wrong, but they believed something. Postmodernists literally the fundamental rule of their philosophy that it's based on is this relativism that they don't actually believe in anything other than the self and other than the power of semantic warfare, right? So that only the, only, the person that, that matters, uh, the person that has, that, that, pow that has power is whoever can make the, bo the best control of language. That's all they believe in. They have nothing else that they hold true to. All this stuff about social justice is just bullshit. It's just a means to take control and to take down what they see as the great evil of history, which is the West, which ironically is the greatest good that, you know, Western civilization has done the greatest good for the largest amount of human life in all of human history. All right, so... Um, Finding my next pipe here. I should have had it lined up, but be patient with me, guys. It's the first time I've ever done this. Okay, here we go. Now I'm filling up the pipe. I'm going to explain my last topic of the evening. Again, unless there are more questions, but we can have a, a question period at the end. If I can find my tobacco. Ah, here we go. All right. So this is the problem with live filming is that I, I smoke my pipes and then I have to like pause and refill and everything. Um, well, we've done pretty good. We're at an hour now. That's that's about as long as I thought the maximum that it was going to get. But uh, I can see that there's still a lot of people watching and some interesting conversations going on. Join the conversation if you are watching now and uh, tell us what you think about what I'm saying or um, talk to us, ask us uh, questions. You're very welcome to join in. Hey, Raving Bean, we're still going for a while. Um, we've uh, been here talking and answering questions and talking about all kinds of matters in the culture wars, basically, mainly as it relates to RPGs, but not exclusively. And uh, who the S uh, Will in New Haven? Do you mean to say SJWs aren't the counterculture? Yeah, that's obvious. They control almost every aspect of the culture. Up until 2015, 2016, they had an almost complete control of the culture. Uh, the culture is this. It's stuff like this. You know, if you're doing 2018 Fantasy Seattle, you're not doing something counterculture. You're not being a bold rebel. Being a bold rebel is if you're playing uh, a game where you know witches are evil right <laughs> where you dare to say that not because you believe witches are evil but because the setting demands that right that's that's what it would be uh, a countercultural thing to do right uh, I don't for the record believe that witches in the modern world are evil <laughs> but uh, but in the Middle Ages if you're doing a fantasy game there has to be defined good and evil. 
Sam Hyde. I'm, I'd have to be reminded who Sam Hyde is, I'm afraid. Um, yes, the EU is pure evil. Yeah, they aren't, Will, you're right. They aren't the descendants of the counterculture either. The counterculture was always about individual liberty. It was about free speech, about the right to offend, uh, about sexual liberation. These people are sexually repressed, right? They talk a lot. You know, millennials talk a lot about, you know, uh, gender identity and sexuality and all this stuff. But we, st you know, um, studies have shown that they are the, the generation that has the least sex in, in ages, right? Like, the, I, I'm, I don't remember if the greatest generation had less sex than they did, maybe. The lost generation already, I think, had more than they, were, than they are having. And certainly the boomers and Gen Xers. So these are people that are fundamentally broken. They're broken at a sexual level. What does that tell you? You know, like where they, they're, they're just that incompetent. They're just, just that shattered. It's, it, you almost have to, you know, bite the bullet and say it's not their fault, but, but it's, um, which it isn't. It's the fault of the people that infested the universities with this toxic uh, ideology, right? But, you know, you can't, you can't put them off the hook for that. You can... You can try to change the people. Yeah, sexuality didn't even exist before 2014. That's right. Just like there were no black superheroes until the Black Panther came out, right? It's that's what we're talking about. Until Waterdeep Heist was released, there were there was no nobody was allowed to be gay in D and D. Now, now everybody can be gay in D and D. Everybody should be gay in D and D. But until Waterdeep Heist came out and Jeremy Crawford did that brave brave thing he did where he showed how brave he was by saying what everybody else in academia and popular culture and media and you know television and movies are saying and comics and video games. Until he said that, nobody was safe to play a gay character in D&D. &D. <laughs> All right. So the last uh, subject I was going to touch on that I was bringing up, like I said, we can keep going later if... There's more to be said, um, or not, but yeah, well, millennials are the worst generation. Um, there's no question about that. Um, I think they're worse than boomers because, um, like I said, the boomers, the counterculture of the boomers at least had certain redeeming qualities, but in a, in a way, they're the same thing because they're the paradigm, the, 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 Postmodern paradigm, as in not not as in postmodernism after modernism. Um, World War II caused a crisis in modernism, which created a, a large number of responses, and it and it forced the creation of a new uh, psychological paradigm, right, where people were no longer following the rational paradigm of modernism; they were following a different kind of set of belief systems. Which at the beginning, as I said before, at the beginning, this was something liberating. At its best, you know, this is what Ken Wilber, I think, calls the green meme. And, and at its best, it's this liberating idea, right? Of saying, you know, that that you're not a cog in a, in a machine, right? You're not a, a soldier to be sent to Vietnam. You're not a, um, you know, you're not a guy that has to spend his life in a suburb with a house and, and a car and, and a dog and two kids, right? If you don't want to. You're not a woman that, that is going to have to be, you know, just a baby maker or something like that. Right? And there's a certain value to that statement. At, at, at the dawn of that paradigm, it represents um, something that creates certain necessary changes, a certain correction in a society that was no longer functional. Uh, if we're in, in the way it was before, because things had changed, and because things were continuing to change in areas like technology and uh, learning and, and those sorts of uh, domains. But the problem is we are now at the end of that paradigm. And, and just like any paradigm, the end of a paradigm is toxic, right? The toxic end of the modernist paradigm was World War II. The toxic end of the, the green boomer paradigm um, is this. It's what we're living right now. It's the, the you know, uh, migrant invasion of Europe, the complete uh, hatred of the West, 
the, the, the collapse of all social values. Um, and something new has to come along to replace it. And that's something new. It can't be religious fundamentalism. It can't be, strictly speaking, rationalism of the, the old kind. Um, what it needs to be is a new sort of systemic, systemic way of thinking, which I think is something that you see to a certain degree among certain types of academics, the, the people from the so-called intellectual dark web, uh, I think are put laying down the, the seeds of that new paradigm. Um, the, well, if you're a millennial, then at least you should be a self-hating millennial. That's that's very important. <laughs> um, and uh, okay, so I was the 2070 paradigm shift. I'm not I'm not quite sure what uh, what paradigm shift is happening in 2070. Is that the one that was going to happen in 2020 in 2001, and then got postponed to 2012, and then and, and has now been postponed as maybe to 2000. 70 is that it um because i don't think we should wait for some you know uh change of aura or something like that for, for some mayan prophecy to come true we can make the paradigm shift um so my my last art, uh point of today or subject of the day has to do with uh, an article that came out i think today in spike magazine and if you don't know what it is spike magazine is a a Marxist magazine printed in England, um, but it is a kind of old school um, and anti-Stalinist uh, Marxist magazine. Right? I don't. I'm not exactly sure if they are Trotskyite. Somebody might have to correct me on that. Um, but um, they are not um, the state kind of Marxists. Um, the the you know the the Eastern Bloc kind of Marxists I should say, um, and but they are real Marxists right these are people who have like these um, this serious Marxist idea which means that their economic theory is completely wrong and most of their theory of history is wrong, but it also means that they despise the SJWs because they are these are the Marxists that believe in the proletariat. Right in the working class and the overthrow that the working class have to lead, that the, that the working class have to be the source of the revolution, right, as it were. And so these guys uh, at Spiked, they, they recognize that modern SJWism is really just um, another version of Stalinism for the middle class, right? It's, it's the middle class trying to create uh, an iron boot over the, the good of the, the average people and the average worker, which is what you see in the United States, uh, the modern regressive left in 2016 uh, was calling the working class the deplorables, right? And they were, they were suggesting that these people were, had to be corrected because they were too stupid to vote for the candidate that that they claimed was the best for them, but that the working class very clearly realized was not the best for them. So, <laughs> all right, my phone vibrates. <laughs> sorry about that. I'm sorry you almost crapped your pants. Uh, these The SJWs did the same thing during Brexit, right? Where you saw that you had the will of the working class uh, and the working class are are, are pro Brexit. Why? Because the European Union does not serve their interests, right? It serves the interests of the moneyed middle classes who are worried that they won't be able to go vacation in Ibiza anymore. You know, they won't be able to go to Spain or France uh, without having a passport, right? And like, they actually campaigned this way. This shows like the, the level of ignorance that they had. They're, they were trying to sell a bunch of people who could never, ever afford to, to go on vacation they're trying to sell them on Remain by saying, if you don't vote Remain, you won't get to go on vacation to Greece, right? Or <laughs> something like that, right? Like, it's just nuts. And and when the fishermen who, whose career, whose livelihoods were destroyed by, um, 
by, by like went out during the Brexit vote and campaigned for breakfast. A flotilla of millionaires on yachts went out and harassed and insulted and spat at them and shouted profanities at them because they weren't being loyal socialists, right? This is this is the fake socialism of the SJW crowd. Today, an article, which, what, the, the whole reason I'm, I was saying all of that is to tell you that Spike Magazine, when it comes to them critiquing the SJW movement, are actually very interesting to read and very credible because they they really, really can't stand these people. They hate them maybe more more than more than Milo Yiannopoulos does, right? Like, or, or on the same level, maybe, because it's the same thing, right? They're claiming to represent them, right? If you're these things, the SJWs are pretending to speak for you. And if you're, a, if you're a real Marxist, they're pretending to speak for you, right? So it's that same level of distaste, right? So they did this article today, which has pointed out something else that I predicted. You know, I was talking about how, check out my cat there, guys. I, I was talking about how uh, the SJWs are eventually going to be doing a, uh, imposing a, a defense of Stalinism, right? That's really only a matter of time, right? There's no way that they're going to, um, that they're going to keep hiding behind the mask. It's kind of like the last barrier for them, right? For a long time, they said, no, no, we're free speech. We just, we're just against hate speech. And then eventually they just started saying, yeah, okay, we're against free speech, right? Um, so it's, it's really only a question of time before these guys go full on to saying, yes, you know, like not just Venezuelan communism, but like uh, the communism, I can't keep this straight here. The communism of Stalin was a really great idea. That's what they're going to be at. Ah, that might have done it. No. Nope. <laughs> this, this is like the most difficult microphone stand in the world. So it's probably also because I've got a really big phone, right? Like I'm doing this. This is a, a Moto G5 Plus, which is a heavy duty phone, both in terms of size and ability. Uh, yeah, my cat is very chill. Uh, so the, um, well, there goes my cat. I'm not even going to keep trying. Um, yeah, there, this is, this is the thing. Uh, I, I think you're probably, you probably saw exactly the same article, Vorpal, that, uh, Goldsmiths College in the University of London, the LGBT club at Goldsmiths College came out with a public defense of Stalin's gulags, where they said... I shit you not, right? Stalin's gulags were a really good idea um, and that it's something that should be imposed on people who are transphobic, okay? So there are now, there are now, you know, these are still the extreme end of the regressive left, you could say, but they are an actual LGBT club at a major university that are now saying anyone who uses the wrong pronoun should be sent to a Stalinist gulag, right? And they're saying, well, yeah, because uh, yeah, Stalin had, uh, he, there in the gulag, there was theater and education and people engaged in activities that was, you know, that were meant to help re-educate them about their errors, right? And so this is actually a wonderful institution and it's exactly what we need. Um, Yes, in fact, the Soviets did send, you're correct, Doc Sammy, the ones that they didn't kill, they would send to gulags. Homosexuality for most of the Soviet Union was seen as a decadent bourgeois perversion, right? Um, and of course, in, in Cuba, uh, Che Guevara was quite dedicated to murdering any LGBT people that he found, right? Um, but uh, let's not confuse these poor students at a uh, right? The gulags were to them a wonderful and marvelous idea. Yeah, that's right. Orwell did have a lot to say about the SJWs of his day. So this is, again, something that I had predicted. I had talked about how this is, this is the end goal for these people is the gulag. It's a, it's, a, it's a matter of time. And that these people, the same people that censor gaming products or that try to ban people from 
uh, gaming forums or from from uh, Twitter or social media, uh, or that try to ban them from the uh, you know DTRPG, you know the one bookshelf, uh, so that they can't sell anything. Um, to say that they're not censors because you can do this somewhere else is nonsense, because censorship is a matter of intent, not of effectiveness, right? If your goal is that if you had the power to do so, you would send someone to a gulag, then then you are essentially pro-gulag. It doesn't matter that you can't send them to a gulag right now. It matters that you would really, really want to, that this would be the goal for you to do, to accomplish this, okay? So... This is what their, their ultimate goal is. Yeah, it is. It's, it's ridiculously ironic and sad that an LGBT group would promote specifically Stalinism. But, you know, this is probably not a group full of normal, you know, gay people. This is a group full of psychotic uh, social justice warriors, psychotic ultra leftist treats. I'm betting, you know, I, I'm, this is going to sound really, really mean of me maybe in some way, but I'm betting that at least one of the people in Goldsmiths University of London LGBT plus group is not actually LGBT or plus, that they are literally pretending to be LGBT because it suits their, you know, so sense of social fashion. <laughs> that that their that their real um, sexual fetish is for extreme totalitarian leftism, right? That that's what really gets them off, and it's not the only place where I'm betting that's happening. Okay. Mm -hmm. Tell me if you think I'm wrong, but I am betting you anything that that's where we're at with these people. Yeah, and uh, in short, you, if you're LGBT, you should go against SCW as a Marxist. I want to point out, Snowman, that there are a lot of people who are LGBT and do go out against the SJWs and the Marxists. Um, in the D&D gate, when D&D gate first happened, uh, when it first boomed, right, when it picked up in a big way and had a whole bunch of people that were, that were sending hate tweets. I don't want to say harassing me. They weren't harassing me. They were just saying what they were thinking, and there was this, you know... Uh, this ton of attacks on LG, on on D and D and D gate claiming uh, that it was you know racist, sexist, homophobic, transphobic, all the usual things that they claim, all those usual weapons that they used to have that don't work anymore because they've used them so much that no one cares, no one cares at all anymore. SJWs. Um, there was a moment there where I had seven hundred dudes attacking me, and I say dudes because most of them, from their Twitter accounts, looked like straight white males, and the people that were standing up for D and D gay room, myself, another Latino, uh, a biological woman, if you want to say that, uh, two trans women, and a disabled gay Jew. Right? So, so this was we were team diversity, right? We could have been from, we could have been the fucking planeteers at that point, right? And and here we were against this horde of 98% straight white males. And, you know, well, I'm gonna say actually 90% straight white males, 8% straight white females, and 2% miscellaneous that were attacking us because supposedly we were alt-right Nazis who hate, you know, uh, trans women and Jews and atheists and Latinos and whatever else, right? Um, so you need to keep that distinction going. It's very important because the point is, we don't actually want to alienate any real gamers, real gamers, whatever their their sexual uh, orientation or gender orientation or race or gender or whatever, whatever you want to call it, right? Any of those, anybody. We don't want to alienate anybody who's a real gamer, period, right? I don't care if you're Irish uh, or if you're Icelandic. <laughs> Or, or if you're from Indonesia, right? I don't, I don't care uh, what your background is. I don't care what you want to do with your genitals or to your genitals. All I care about is whether you play or not, right? and whether you're a gamer or not, and whether you're going to stand up for gaming. Um, yeah, almost all the gay people I know are normal too, and 
Uh, I don't know a lot of gay people here who voted for Trump because I'm not in the United States, but uh, I'm I know that Trump, you know, from some studies, got more of the LGBT vote than any Republican candidate in history. Um, and you know, he, there's a, a big movement there. So so yeah, so let's remember that if you do if you don't agree with me on this, if you don't believe that if you really did think that gaming is only for straight white males or something like that, then D&D &D, D &D gate is not about you. It's not, <laughs> it's not, uh, it's not for you. All right. Uh, because what we're doing is following the, 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 the spirit of the infamous white nationalist, Martin Luther King Jr. When he, you know, he said, to, and I'm paraphrasing, uh, I, I don't want to judge any of the little gamers by the color of their skin, just by the content of their character sheet, okay? So, uh, you know, I know that nowadays, obviously, uh, Martin Luther King is considered an alt-right Nazi, but, uh, but I still believe in, in that idea and those ideals. So uh, those were all the things I wanted to talk about now. We're now at our, what are we at, 11.20 here. So that's uh, an hour and 20 minutes. Yeah, an hour and 22 minutes of filming. Um, I'm going to give you guys one last chance. If there's uh, questions you want to ask me about subjects in gaming or uh, the culture wars or whatever, uh, this would be the moment to do so. Let me know if you liked. Well, I, I think it's fair to say that you did like this live stream because I have a, we got a lot of people watching now. Um, we had, I think, a peak of what was it, twenty something, twenty, whatever, watching. Which uh, for a, a uh, oh, there we just hit twenty for a um, a channel with this number of subscribers uh, is pretty good, I'd say. Um, and for the hour that I'm doing it. So uh, I'm going to add uh, that if you like this, please subscribe and please share this video or any of the other videos on my channel. It's, it's very, very important if you, want to, um, if you want to help this fight, then you have to share this stuff. You have to promote it, right? Um, that's as important as if you wanted to, you know, send money to my PayPal or, or support inappropriate characters on Patreon. Um, if you can't do those things, then then share the video. If you can do those things, still share the videos because that's how we win, right? We don't win. As, I'm very grateful and I will produce more if you send money, right? I'm not going to lie about that. I will. But uh, you don't, we don't win as a whole by you sending me money. We win as a whole by you sharing the videos, right? By you promoting... Um, this position and showing people that there are alternatives. Um, Solomon Kane, I am not familiar with the index card RPG system. No, I'm sorry. Um, I, I think I vaguely heard it mentioned at some point, but uh, I do not really know anything about it. No. Is it good? Do you know if it was made by someone who, who doesn't despise you? Um, well, yes and no, Vorpal, because uh, I know that I've been gaming with non-white people and non-males for since, like, my very first gaming table when I was 11 years old, right? We had a, uh, what was his name, Adrian? Yeah, I'm not going to give his last name, but uh, we had a Chinese kid there. Uh, we had a Guatemalan kid there, right? This was in Canada, right? Uh, but not in, you know, not in Toronto or something like that. This is in Alberta, which is, you have to understand, Alberta is the Texas of Canada, okay? It is, it is the most conservative part of Canada. It's where all the oil is, where all the cows are. Um, it's very consistently um, anti-bullshit, right? But, but, you know... There was always, I've never been in a moment where I, my hobby has been something of exclusively white males, right? And there were girls who played and all of that, right? And in the original D&D table, there were women who played, right? And there were, there were women designers involved from the beginning. Um, so we have to fight that lie, right? That's the lie. That's the whole, 
you know, there was never a black superhero until Black Panther the movie came out, right? That's the bullshit that they're trying to push. They're trying to push the idea that they are the ones, that the SJWs are the ones who have made um, popular culture safe for anyone who isn't white, as if there weren't tons and tons of people who aren't white or who aren't male or who aren't straight that have already loved these things for decades and, uh, and that they have been represented for decades, right? I mean, North Star in, in Marvel Comics came out, what, in the 90s, right? Like, it's, he's, there, there have been gay characters in Marvel Comics for like 15 years longer than Hillary Clinton was pro-gay, right? She was anti-gay for 15 years of Marvel Comics having gay characters, right? Um, so, you know, there's all of that, right? You, you've got to... Uh, you want to, to stand up for that notion so that you take away their ownership of it. They can't, you can't allow them to, to try to own and weaponize um, minorities as if they're the ones that get to, to speak for them and, and that they're one monolithic block that get to decide what everybody else, uh, what all of them want from us and what everybody in general gets to say or believe. Right. The best OSR besides my stuff to look into. Um, well, my first of all, my stuff is the best OSR stuff. <laughs> but there's other OSR stuff that's really good and, and, and I'd say really close to being as good. Um, as much as we disagree about a lot of stuff, I do very much like um, James Raggy's... Uh, Lamentations of the Flame Princess. And um, although some of his adventures, you know, some of his adventures are magnificent and others not so much. You have to be careful. Uh, I do really like Kevin Crawford's stuff. Uh, he makes some really, really good concepts. Uh, Star Without Number is a, is a very decent uh, um, fantasy, no, sorry, science fiction uh, OSR game. While... Um, yeah, Godbound I haven't looked at, but uh, Red Tide is a really interesting, weird fantasy sort of setting. Uh, I haven't really looked at Midderlands yet. Um, Dungeon Crawl Classics, to me, is huge. Dungeon Crawl Classics is the gonzo game. Um, my only criticism of them is that setting-wise, they aren't gonzo enough, which is what I'm trying to fix with my Last Sun setting that has been an epic campaign going on for five years now, I think, six years and that I've been releasing, slowly releasing product from The Last Sun, you know, the Gonzo setting in RPG Pundit Presents. Um, yeah, you're right. We don't, that's, that's again the point. We don't really care, uh, you know, if your friend in junior high is Puerto Rican, he's not Puerto Rican um, first, and then your friend, he's not Puerto Rican because he's your friend, at least I hope not. That's the kind of bullshit that you'd see with... Uh, or rather, he's not your friend because he's Puerto Rican, I mean to say, right? Um, that's the sort of bullshit that, that you'd expect from the SJW crowd. He's just your friend, right? And the people you game with at your table are just the people you game with at your table. A real gamer doesn't care as long as nobody else is bringing it into the subject, right? Um, about what any of the other people at the table have in terms of race, gender, you know, sexuality, or what have you. Um, and most of those people don't care either. Nobody, like, there's no demand from Latino gamers that you make a special Latino D&D &D for, you know, full of Latino stuff, right? We don't have Latino stuff to do that is special for us, that is different for everybody else, right? Uh, Latinos here in, in goddamn South America, the games they love to play the most are, you know, D&D, &D, the settings they love the most are like, you know, Lords of the Ring and Star Wars and vampires and... They, they like superheroes. The superheroes they like are our superheroes, are the superheroes of, you know, the you know, DC and Marvel. There's, there's, there's some very specific, like, little subcultural variants, but, but people... Oh, yeah, Fantastic Heroes and Witchery is a great game, and uh, it's made by the same person who made Dark Albion and Lion and Dragon in terms of the editor the same, and the same um, layout, which... Uh, if you've ever looked at my books, they're full of amazing art. They're, they're wonderfully laid out. They're very easy to read. 
Um, so he's uh, very strongly recommended. Um, so, so yeah, like there's there's no demand of that from anyone except this crowd, the SJW crowd. They're the only ones that are demanding that we turn everything into an exercise in identity politics indoctrination. All right. So I think I'm I'm gonna finish up around here. This has been a very interesting, I think a very successful live stream. And uh, thank you all of you for coming. Thank you to all of my subscribers. I think I've got almost 400 subscribers now. I don't know, um, which is which is great, you know. And uh, we need to build that up some more. So please share the videos. Please subscribe if you haven't done so. <clears throat> it's uh, it's something that I that that will allow you to always make sure you don't miss a pundit live stream or a pundit video. Share this everywhere. Like I said, if you wanted to support me on on PayPal, go down in the description. I'll put in the uh, if I can put in a description here. I'll put in the um, the RPG Pundit uh, dot dot com. You go there. There's a PayPal button. Um, and generally, just uh, keep spreading the message right these these guys only have power if you are quiet so i guess that's about it for today and uh again thank you all we'll try this again sometime um currently smoking a raleigh hawk bill with image virginia